So good evening, you hearty souls. I am Marcia Moore, and on behalf of the Gateway Science Museum, I am delighted to welcome you to this, the final talk in our four-part Spring Museum Without Walls lecture series. We are delighted to have all of you here with us. And you might be interested to know, April is Citizen Science Month, which is quite appropriate for this week's lecture. Before proceeding to tonight's presentation, I want to thank our MWOW committee, our executive director, Adrian McGraw, and community board member, Dr. Rachel Teasdale, although Dr. Teasdale can't be with us this evening. We also are extremely appreciative of all our speakers who are donating their time, talents, and knowledge to the furtherance of teaching and learning about science in our region and beyond. We are also grateful to North State Public Radio, co-sponsor of this series. And we do acknowledge and are mindful that CSU Chico stands on lands that were originally occupied by the first people of this area, the Machupta. And we recognize their distinctive spiritual relationship with this land and the waters that run through campus. We are humbled that our campus resides upon sacred lands that once sustained the Machupta people for centuries. This evening, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Jeff Davids, Assistant Professor in the College of Civil Engineering and also in the College of Agriculture at Chico State. He obtained his BS in Engineering from Cal Poly, his Master's in Hydrogeology from Chico State, and his PhD from the University of Delft in the Netherlands, where his dissertation focused on mobilizing young researchers, citizen scientists, and mobile technology to close water data gaps. Dr. Davids has been a water resources consultant for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and is a water resources engineer with the private company Davids Engineering, a company whose goals are to enhance productivity and profitability of agricultural enterprises and improve environmental stewardship. He will share with us some of the innovative work he has done in these areas specifically as related to water resources and demonstrate its value in areas as far flung as Nepal and closer to home in Shasta Valley in California. As with our previous lectures, Dr. Davids will answer audience questions at the end of his talk. So please make use of the chat column for your questions, which will be passed on to Dr. Davids toward at the end of his talk. Dr. Jeff Davids, welcome. Well, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be with you this evening. Sometimes I have to fake that statement because I'll be giving a talk or something for Nepal or Afghanistan or the Netherlands and I, I say this evening for them, but it might be in the middle of the night for me. So it is a pleasure to have like a normal time zone uh, interaction here. Um, well, thank you again for this opportunity. Um, as I start off with that, I was, I was hoping just to share a few uh, reflections. Oftentimes when I um, talk to students about water resources, I try to start with a very kind of tangible sort of three point, uh, if you will, message to, to hammer home just some a basic framework to think about water resources. And I like to do it with using these virtual backgrounds here. So um, when you think about water resources, I, I like to call it the three twos of, of water management the three twos of water management. And the first, the first two is too much, is too much. And so you see this village behind me, this is actually the village of uh, called Delft. It's a small village in the Netherlands and they've been battling the sea and the Rhine um, for centuries. And so the first the, of the three twos is too much water, right? We're often battling the idea of flooding and that sort of catastrophe. Um, and if, if we kind of look through some different contexts now, uh, you might also think about my friend Hanuman here. Uh, Hanuman lives in the Terai of the Nepal uh, plains down by India. And every monsoon, June, July, August, the monsoon rains just crash onto the Himalayas, causing the rivers to swell and the Ganges and the uh, Karnali and the Koshi to jump their banks and flood. Uh, right through Hanuman's house here uh, down in a village called Sasotia. So he's kind of living this, this one of the three twos, the, the too much. Uh, but then of course, there's, uh, you know, there's also the reality of too little. 
So that's one of the, the three twos, you know, and of course we all know this. This is a, a picture of what's called a Dunga Dara. It means stone spout in the Pali. Uh, in fact, Hiti is the original word. That's a, a Newar word. And um, these stone spouts were the historical water supply for the Kathmandu Valley. And the water would actually come out of the ground just back here on this side of the picture and flow through these Dungadara. And then the community members would come and fill their buckets. And now one after another, they're drying up. And these community members have to drill wells deeper and deeper and deeper. And this is the story, one of the three twos, the reality of two little. And it's not just in Nepal, of course. Uh, this is a shot from Myanmar, where the artesian wells of the central dry zone are slowly drying as pumping increases for both urban and agricultural purposes. And these artesian wells you see behind me that flow freely like they used to in Compton, of all places. Do you know that? Compton, Los Angeles Basin had one of the largest free-flowing wells in the 1860s. Could you, could you believe that? And of course, there's no flowing wells in Los Angeles anymore. And unfortunately, that's maybe the, the future for um, the central dry zone of Myanmar as well. And to round off the final, uh, the third two, uh, it's really a challenge of too dirty, right? And so unfortunately, I bring you here now to um, the Hanumante River. This is myself here in, in some hazmat gear taking a flow measurement. Um, and even though it's too dirty, we have to get in there and do the accounting work. We have to understand how much water there is, but this is a sad reality. And it's not just over there, you know, we have our own problems. This is the Bagmati River as it flows through the Kathmandu Valley, just piles of refuge uh, on, on refuse on either side. So I just uh, wanted to kind of take you through that journey a little bit. And of course, maybe we could land our journey here and I'll keep this as my virtual background. This is one of my favorite places here uh, up in the high Himalayas near the border with Tibet, a place called the Fu Glacier. Uh, just a few uh, kilometers down this glacier, there's a small village named Fu Gao and there's a, a, a community of about 200 people that speak their own dialect. Um, and uh, I know a few words, but um, just a very distinct and beautiful uh, community, but they're dealing with climate change, right? These glaciers are shrinking rapidly. And so another story of too little. So uh, those are just some general reflections, too much, too little, too dirty. Um, but I wanna hop in with actually sharing a presentation now that just continues some pictures and and uh, talks a little bit more specifically about the topic of, of what I was uh, hoping to share about today. And so I'm gonna share my screen now. I hope you could see those pictures behind me relatively uh, in a decent size. Um, and I'm gonna get organized here and make sure I can see everybody who has their cameras on because that always helps. Okay, great. So what I'd like to spend the rest of our time together tonight talking about is this idea of reverse innovation. And I've had the pleasure to spend um, the last few years, starting in 2015, um, working internationally in Nepal and Myanmar and, and uh, Afghanistan and Ghana and, and China and different places. Um, and it's been really rewarding to see uh, uh, some of the good ideas bearing fruit there and then the opportunity to bring these ideas home you know, to, to Northern California, where I'm from uh, originally. And um, just a quick shot here. This is some context about who I am and um, my wife and children here. And of course, if you ever have a chance to go to this place, it's called Tengboche. You got Amadablam and Mount Everest here peeking over the top. Um, just a wonderful spot. Why do I love water? It's, it's probably why you love water, maybe why you're here this morning, um, because it touches so many parts of our life. Right. And if you think about the sustainable development goals, you know, it really touches all of them. But if you really pull out, you know, I'd say it, out of these 17, it's really touching on 12 of them very strongly uh, out of these sustainable development goals. And that's partly why we're so passionate about water here. Um, the main points I want to make are, are really threefold here. Um, and I, I just want to kind of drill in with some pictures and stuff to each one of these points. 
And I know that that you guys are, you know, the fact that you're here, you're this, this is probably something that uh, I'm not sure how much new information I guess we'll hear, but I hope maybe we package it up in a different uh, manner or maybe with some new stories here. And number one, you know, the water cycle is complicated. And, and we humans are part of that complication. We better, we better think a little bit more about how we teach our children things like the water cycle, right? And, uh, and for the second point, you know, as is the case with our finances, there's really no hope of managing our water resources without proper accounting. And so I'm not sure where the disconnect started. It, perhaps it's because it's difficult to account for water. But um, it's very important that we start with the accounts. And then finally, and this kind of ties into the speaker from last week, Dr. Christina Buck, um, this idea of groundwater and surface water being one resource with two different names. And just a quick example of bringing home these ideas from Nepal, applying them here in Chico to learn something new about our own water resources. So that's kind of where we're headed. The water cycle. It's just simple and beautiful green, this perfect cycle. <laughs> um, of course, this is what we teach our kids, but it's missing some important elements. Number one, where are the people in our water cycle? Where are the people in this figure that we're looking at? I mean, I think that's kind of a big thing to miss, right? Um, number two, where are the different biomes in this, in this water cycle? You see, all I see is green. I don't see any deserts. I don't see any, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of a whole bunch of wetlands. You know, there, there's really just kind of like forests, and there's this green stuff. Okay, and and finally, where's the seasonality? You know, is there is it always raining, or is there times of the year where it's maybe dry? So I think we're kind of missing some of these key elements and. Uh, you know, seasonality um, uh, and actually interannual variability is, is uh, I love this shot of, of Governor Brown here um, back at the time of our last drought where he shows like this is what California's, you know, rainfall does over time. Boy, this is difficult to manage, isn't it? When you go from 40 down to four, right? Imagine if your income level did something like that. It'd be kind of hard to balance the books, right? If your income was bouncing around that much. Um, and of course, you know, a shot of the spatial variability, right? The different biomes. This is a shot out of the Ministry of Irrigation and Livestock in Kabul in Afghanistan. And just see how arid it is. So arid, right? You don't see something like that in our water cycles, uh, typically in our diagrams. And finally, the Kathmandu Valley, you know, this is maybe a more realistic picture of the water cycle where we have precipitation, interacting with the built environment. We have evapotranspiration from the forests, but then we have factories and houses and wastewater, and then the groundwater underneath it interacting. So it's, it's, a, little bit, it's a little bit more complicated perhaps. Um, so that's, you know, that's my reflection on, on this complication of the water cycle and, and maybe the importance of adding some nuance to how we teach people the water cycle, even how we think of it uh, when we think about this evaporation, condensation, precipitation, and runoff. Don't forget the people. Don't forget the biomes. And don't forget the, the, the temporal and spatial variability that are, that's inherent in those systems. Okay, so number, number two, the second key point. As is the case with our finances, there's no hope of managing our water resources without proper water accounting. All right. So if you think about water scarcity, water scarcity is something that we're going to have to live with. Uh, as the demand for water continues to increase, the supplies perhaps say the same, perhaps change in the future. Uh, this idea of scarcity is, is going to continue uh, to be an issue. We're, we're running up against this as a, as a, as a global a community here. And um, my, my friend and colleague, uh, Pascual, uh, Pasquale Studuto, uh, has this great progression of, of how he thinks, he works with the Food and Agriculture Organization, 
And he has this uh, three pronged approach of how he thinks that fodder scarcity needs to be addressed. And it's really, you got to start with the water accounts. You got to figure out how much water do you have? Where is it? And how does that change in space and time? Do the accounting. And then once you do the accounting, you can establish your limits. You know, here, here's the limits that I need to play within to be sustainable. And, and, and just really recognizing that there are limits, right? And that starts with the accounting and then we do, the, and then we build these limits. And then within the limits, then we can optimize, right? We can try to maximize our productivity, whether it's, uh, you know, environmental productivity or economic productivity or caloric productivity in terms of food supply, right? But this three-step process is, is really important. Uh, if we want to avoid things like artificially ephemeral streams, that's a big one. You know, streams that used to run year round and now they dry up. Maybe we wanna set our limits such that that doesn't happen. You know, so we have to kind of really think about this process of setting our limits. So I, uh, I'm, I'm wrestling a little bit with this one and I'm not sure it's 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 uh, incredibly important, but I will I will take a moment to try to put a little bit of a finer point on what we mean when we say water use. And this has to do with this idea of water accounting. When we say water use, do we does it always mean the same thing? Like, oh, I use some water to take a shower, or I use some water for my garden, or I use some water to irrigate my orchard. Are all those things the same? Maybe I use some water to generate power, okay? Let's take two of those examples, the generate power and irrigate my orchard in terms of water use. The key difference between those two water uses is that one is consumptive and one is non-consumptive. So when you do the water accounts, you have to separate these two. So when you put water through a, a, a turbine to generate electricity, that water actually stays in the system. It goes back to the river, maybe it goes into a reservoir. It's available for a second use, right? It's non-consumptive in that sense. But when you put water onto an orchard and part of that water is actually pulled through the root structure and into the xylem and out to the leaves and then through the stoma, and out into the atmosphere is transpiration, why that water is consumed. It's moving into the atmosphere and it's moving down the jet stream. It's no longer available in that watershed or that basin to use again. So when you think about water use and when you do the water accounts, you have to always separate these two. So all water use is not the same. So remember that there's this idea of consumptive and non-consumptive. And I'm going to skip through the, the rest because, you know, as scientists, we like to even make it more complicated and talk about beneficial and non-beneficial, recoverable and non-recoverable. Don't worry about that. Just remember consumptive and non-consumptive. That's a key point. Okay, so how do we do this water accounting, right? How do we do these water accounts? Well, to tell you the truth, I've spent... Uh, you know, probably 20 years thinking about this and working on this, and it's really hard. It's really hard. It's not like pennies that you're counting that come into your bank account. You know, the water is, is distributed. It's, it's difficult. It covers huge areas over long periods of time. There's no good way to count it like a dollar and a cent. And so one of the exciting ways of doing these water counts is actually using these satellites. So on this on the screen, I have some hand drawn. I'm a terrible artist. I, I, I apologize for the graphics here, but I like to use my own stuff as much as I can. So I don't have to uh, you know, pay any royalties to any of these uh, fancy image generators. So, um, you know, we have we have thousands of satellites that orbit our Earth and they're taking pictures of different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And from that, we can actually learn about so many things about our Earth. And it's actually getting better every day. There's more and more satellites going up there, more and more things we can learn from these satellites. You can measure rainfall with a satellite. Can you believe that? From space, hundreds, perhaps thousands of kilometers away. You can measure evapotranspiration, the actual consumption of water through the plants. You can measure land cover and land use, even topography. These are all wonderful things we can measure with satellites. It's just incredible. 
Um, and, and one of the pleasures I've had over the last few years is working with uh, water resource managers at a national scale in Afghanistan. That's this top country here, which is a headwater country uh, for the Indus and the Amu Darya and the Helmand and the Harirat and the Kabul River. Um, and uh, the top picture there is a meeting there in Dubai. Um, and then I've also been able to work with this group uh, down here. Let's see if you can find the uh, find the foreigner in the Longji here. Ah, there's the foreigner in the Longji. Okay, we spotted him. <laughs> uh, if you ever get a chance to wear a Longji, it's very, very comfortable. Uh, definitely take, take up that offer. Um, but it's just a wonderful group of people in Myanmar. And boy, Myanmar, um, you know, we really need to think about how to support Myanmar these days. There's some tough stuff going on there uh, right now as we speak. Uh, but what we're training them together with the Food and Agriculture Organization is all about how do we use these satellite data. You know, it's not like it's not like you just kind of, you know, get on the Internet and press a button and then boom, your water accounts are done. It's actually really complicated and takes a whole different skill set that most people aren't learning in school nowadays. Even in the U.S., we're not learning it. Um, I'm trying to change that here at, at Chico State a little bit. Um, happy to say I got a new course approved for the fall that's all about this uh, idea of how we use satellite information for water management. Um, but so excited to be working with these groups and the, and the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, working on a, a, a Python open source a program called Scalable Water Balances from Earth Observations, the SWEO for short. Uh, it's just this open source, uh, remotely sensed data driven water balance approach. Let me just show you some cool pictures from, from some of this work. Um, this is uh, on the way into Kabul from a couple of years ago. Uh, just a reminder that you know precipitation comes in different forms and we have to account for all of it, whether it's snow or rain. Uh, and some of the nice watersheds of the, uh, the kind of the end of the Himalayas as you, as you uh, come into Kabul. So here's the country of Afghanistan with the five primary river basins that I had mentioned earlier. And, you know, one of the challenges with the water counts in Afghanistan, they've been at war for almost 40 years with a variety of different people, right? And so, do you think measuring the rainfall was a high priority, you know, as they struggle through these conflicts? Unfortunately not, you know, unfortunately not. Even though they're so dependent on water, um, their economy is so dependent on water resources, they, they weren't able to keep good records of measurements. Thankfully, the satellites are doing a better job for us nowadays. And here's a picture of the rainfall uh, for 2015 um, based on a, a satellite a source called CHIRPS. It's actually made by a group out of Santa Barbara. You can see the mountains, they get maybe up to a thousand millimeters. So we're talking like uh, 40 inches, so a fair amount, of, fair amount of rain. Whereas some of these dry places like the Helmand might only get about a hundred millimeters of rain, so only maybe four inches quite dry. So we see that spatial variability that we missed in our, in our water cycle diagram earlier on. Okay. So that precipitation is interesting, but how about evapotranspiration? Now, this is the water that's actually being consumed by the crops, actually going through the roots and through the stoma and out into the atmosphere. Um, and uh, it's very important to have a nice accounting of evapotranspiration. We can do this with satellite information, uh, what's called the surface energy balance. And uh, we, we look at the different fluxes of energy and come up with these pictures. The green means that there's lots of evapotranspiration. The red means that there's very little. And from this, we can actually see the river basins and the irrigation schemes in different parts. So you see the Helmand uh, has a big irrigation scheme off of the Helmand River before it comes into Iran here. You can see the Harirad, um, as it makes its way out of the mountains, there's lots of irrigation schemes in this basin as well. And these are consumptive use. You know, this is consumptive use. We have to account for this. How do we do it? Well, thankfully we can do it with satellites more and more now. Um, oh, <laughs> the interesting thing about this is that if you take the difference between the two, if you look at precipitation, 
that's kind of like the deposit into your bank account. And then you look at evapotranspiration, why that's like the withdrawal out of your bank account. If you do the difference, that's kind of like how much water you have extra, you know, just like your budget. If you have more water coming in than going out, then you have a little bit of extra water. And the blues are the places where there's extra water. The reds are the places where there's a deficit of water. Just with these two accounts, we get to really see where are the sources of water. You see it's the mountains up here. That's where the water's coming from. Of course, we knew that, but it's interesting to see. And then the desert areas down here at the tail end, that's the places where the water is being used. And we actually need to supply some additional water there. Interesting. Well, that's the top down approach. But how about the bottom up approach? And where are, the, where are the citizens? How can they get involved in this? And this is uh, what I was really excited to work on in Nepal. I don't know if you guys know, um, almost half the world has a smartphone. A little bit less than half has access to a managed, safely, uh, safely managed toilet. Can you believe that? More smartphones than there are safely managed toilets out there in terms of accessibility. Well, that's a reality. Is there a way we can sort of leverage that somehow? You know, there's also all these science, technology, engineering, and math students, STEM students. Uh, they could really use some practical experience collecting data about our water resources. Maybe they could be involved in the water accounting. And then of course, there's people like you, billions of community members with minds full of stories right, related to how over their life they've interacted with these water systems and perhaps how they've changed over time. How can you get involved as a water accounter, right? How could, how could you possibly contribute to the water accounts? Well, that's kind of what we were investigating in Nepal, and, and this is an icon for smartphones for water, smartphones for water, or S4W. This is what we called the project. And the idea was partner with community members, partner with their smartphones and partner with some young researchers, some of these underutilized STEM students. And if we can put this all together, can we make some sense of our water accounts? Uh, and it was funny because, you know, it's like, can you get a PhD using recycled soda bottles? I, I guess I'm the first maybe proof that it's possible <laughs> because, you know, it's, and it's funny because it seems like a simple sort of silly thing to do, but literally we don't know how much it rains in different parts of Nepal. And in something as simple as taking a soda bottle, cutting the top off, making, put some concrete in the bottom, glue a scale onto the side, make a rain gauge, less than a dollar, repurpose materials. And then, and then just teach the community members and work with local students. This is Anurag, who is one of our student workers. Uh, and then this is a community member here in the Balku River Basin. Um, there we go, we have a spot where we know the rainfall now. How do we know it's right? Well, we have them take a picture, you see? And from the picture, we have a whole team of other students that look at the picture and look at the GPS location and make sure the data is right. If it's not right, then they commu communicate back to them and, and correct the problem. And then this is citizen science. This is very, very exciting. We're trying to close these water accounting data gaps. And um, you know, altogether, each one of these little pictures actually is from somebody who is involved in this project. And altogether, it's exciting that together we formed this Smartphones for Water family where we're putting together these young researchers, the citizen scientists and the mobile technology. Um, and so right now we're kind of in a transition phase where what we started in Nepal is continuing and it's very exciting despite you know, COVID, uh, this is one thing that we can actually continue because uh, it's, it's like a grassroots effort. There's no, the satellites keep taking pictures, the citizen scientists keep working, right? There's no problem with, with COVID for this. Uh, and we're trying to figure out how to kind of grow into different spaces and different uh, continents, but here's where we're working so far. Just a couple of shots of some precipitation locations uh, from the last year. The map is a little bit more updated than this, but some Ghana, the Netherlands, uh, lots in Nepal, and then some in California, and have a few friendly folks up in Washington that are participating so far. And I'll just skip, skip over that. So, you know, water counting from the top down and the bottom up. And, and I, if I can, if, if you will, I'd love to borrow from one of our great presidents, uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln to say that these are data of the people, by the people, for the people. 
right? And I'd like to repurpose that quote in the context of water counting. Okay, well, interesting. So I think we've learned some stuff and, and please, uh, I think you mentioned 40 minutes. I'm keeping an eye on the clock. So I, I, it seems like we have about uh, eight minutes left, but please interrupt me at any point and, and tell me to, to stop if I, if I get carried away here, but I tend to get excited, but I'm, I'm gonna go for nine, uh, for 740 is gonna be what, what the, the, when the plane's gonna land here. So um, this last point really is all about now, uh, we've just kind of done a real whirlwind of some exciting things uh, happening in different places. And you know, how does this land back here in, in Chico? And um, to me, one of the big, data gaps or sort of challenges with water counting in our home, uh, the, the Northern California context, Chico, a place full of families and farms and feathers and fish, right? All those Fs that we love so much. Uh, how does this land here in, in Chico? Well, maybe Christina or maybe um, Eddie shared a figure like this that talks about how groundwater just the water down filling up the, the, the gaps between the soil particles interacts with our streams. And historically, this is uh, what the picture looked like. This is the Consumnus River actually from a colleague at the Nature Conservancy. And what it shows is that there's this nice dynamic exchange between the groundwater and the stream uh, historically. And uh, of course, this is what's called a gaining stream, where water is coming from the groundwater into the stream. And if you pump some water out of here, what we need to know is that there's, and it could be the city of Chico, urban pumping. It could be ag pumping. So it's not just one group, right? It's, it could be municipal, it could be industrial, it could be agricultural. But if you pump groundwater, it's going to come from somewhere. And one of those places could be, it starts to take the water that used to go to the stream. This is called capture. So you could reduce that water. In fact, uh, you could actually change the direction completely where now water goes from the stream into your aquifer to supply that water for your wells. And you see the water level goes down a little bit here in our picture. And of course, if you continue to pump, why then you can actually disconnect the stream from the aquifer below. And at this point, you know, there can be significant uh, ecological impacts to this, right? The stream might even go dry uh, when maybe it historically wouldn't have. And this is what we call a disconnected stream. So with, with that in mind, um, you know, I, I started thinking, well, we got all these students, they need some summer uh, activities. Why not put them on a bike? and uh, maybe grab a couple students, get them on some bicycles. I'll join them when I can. Let's go from Bear Hole up in, up in uh, Upper Park, all the way down to the Sacramento River down here, what we call BCC 06. So Bear Hole and then Five Mile, uh, right by the, the highway of, off of Valambrosia on campus, and then the edge of Chico just past kind of Rose Drive Bridge there. Uh, and then the Sacramento River confluence are close to it. Let's just go to those sites throughout the summer and measure the flow rate, do the water counting. And let's put it into our smartphones so it's well organized, take our GPS so we don't lose track of where these data are from. And what can we learn about this? Well, it turns out we learned some pretty interesting things. So here's a colleague Raul, um, who's a transfer student to Chico State. Really happy to work with Raul. And uh, this is down by the uh, Sacramento River confluence here. We used an acoustic device to measure the flow. It's, it's nerdy science stuff, but you can do uh, really nice measurements of flow rate uh, using this device. Raul is a specialist now at it. And uh, here is, uh, here's some of our results. Now there's a lot going on on this graph, so let me talk you through it here. Um, you see there were six sites back on the previous map from upstream to downstream. And on this graph, there's also six lines that make their way from left to right here. And the blue line represents the BCC01. That's the flow at bear hole over time. So, so the higher the number goes, the more the flow rate is. And the lower the number goes, the lower the flow rate is. And again, this, this horizontal axis is, is time. It starts in mid-May of, of last year. 
and it runs through uh, just uh, last weekend actually is when Raul came out and took his most recent set of measurements. And so then you can see that there's the BCC01 is the blue line, and then there's the, the kind of dashed uh, orange line, and then there's the green line, and so, so on and so forth, all the way down to BCC06, which is our just above the Sacramento River spot. Now, some things should jump out to you right away from this graph if you, if you like to look at data. I, I love data. If you like to look at data, one thing that might jump out is, is uh-oh, these two sites go dry, zero water for at least part of the year. You see zero water for at least part of the year. Now the fourth site, this is the one on campus, boy, look how close that one gets to going dry. Pretty close. This is our campus. This is this place that, that we learned about that supported the Machupta people for centuries, right? Almost dry here. Hmm. All right, well, the other thing that you can see is that the flow is almost always decreasing as you go from upstream to downstream. You see, even in the middle of the summer, if you look at it, in the middle of the summer, let's say, uh, let's say August here, or August, September, see, it goes from having about 20 CFS, I'll use uh, uh, British terms here, 0.6 cubic meters per second, 600 liters per second, or 20 CFS, that's cubic feet per second, all the way down to zero. Completely dried up, right? Now, thankfully that recovers. So when it starts to rain, the flows jump up here. Uh, so by, by March, we actually had water in all those six sites again. So we had this kind of living connected stream. But the other thing that should jump out to you is that here we are in mid April. And if you look at this red, Oops, if you look at this red dashed line that I put on here, if you look at that line, you see mid-April right now looks like July of last year. You see I'm using the same, the same site here. Actually, I didn't do a great job, actually. I should have gone back to here. Sorry about that. So it looks like June of last year. So it's already two months ahead in terms of how low the flow is right now in Big Chico Creek. We're in the midst of a really critical, critical year in terms of water supply. Okay, um, you know, I, out of the sake of time, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna skip through this one, but this just shows how the stream dries and then re-wets over time. And I, I can share this presentation. You can take a closer look at it if this is of interest. Um, and uh, yeah, let me just jump through that. Yeah, so to, to summarize, you know, here's the points. The water cycle is complicated, don't forget it. Um, just with our finances, just as it is with our finances, there's no hope of, of doing sustainable water management without accounting, without these proper accountings. And uh, in groundwater and surface water, these are one resource with two different names. And it's pretty cool how we got to grab some ideas from our Nepali friends and then apply them here in Chico to learn something that's really important for us and for our community and uh, maybe inform some of the management decisions we make moving forward. I'm thankful that we're doing this really closely with the county and different water agencies so that we can actually use these data to try to make better decisions. So with that, I'll say thank you, Dhanyabad, Dankivel. Uh, let's see, let me get this one right. That's uh, Jezuba, and then there's uh, Sawati Kap, or, or Kap Kun Kap, and then there's Tashakur, of course, at the end there uh, from uh, Dari. So those are all thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you. And Adrian, I think, is going to lead us through the questions. That was superb. Thank you so much. Uh, I love this first question. It uh, comes back to a fundamental question. Um, is there uh, new water created in nature, or is it a finite number of molecules? Is, is water created or destroyed? Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, and this is such a such an important question because we when we talk about water scarcity, you know, I think people start to get worried like that somehow the water is being destroyed, like we're somehow completely losing it off the you know off of our biosphere here, or somehow it's and so a fundamental you know principle is that uh, matter, you know, with the exception of of some of the atomic conversions that happen, matter is neither you know created nor destroyed, right? So we have this conservation of mass. Right. Um, so, so, but 
it can change where it is and 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 it can change you know the the timing and the and the spatial nature of that can really change and that's where we're getting worried about water resources because you know the water that gets consumed remember we talked about that the water that gets consumed from say the central valley right maybe it was water that entered in 50 years ago ran down the Sierra Nevada mountains into the aquifers underneath Fresno, let's say, and then pumped out, consumed by an orchard and into the atmosphere. Well, that water didn't get destroyed. It's in the atmosphere. It might rain again into the Rockies or it might make its way off to the East Coast or out over to Africa. But for the Central Valley, that water is gone. Right, so if you look at it's a it's a scale issue. If you look at the global scale, yeah, water is is just kind of moving its place in time, so there's no problem, right? But if you look at the smaller scale, why then it can become a problem? Thank you. Um, you had mentioned when we were looking at the very simplistic uh, water cycle uh, graphics. Um, it triggered a couple of questions about uh, children learning about the water cycle in school and just sort of, you know, where do we um, internalize that cycle and what are some improvements? You mentioned, you know, putting people in that cycle. What are some other improvements that may come from um, education at a younger age? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a great question. I think. Um... I think probably the main point, and that's kind of why I wanted to state that one first, is like making sure that people are in there because um, it's so important that people understand at a young age that the water cycle is not this passive process that happens out there, you know, that that somehow is just like set in stone and is like good, and and then we just sort of benefit from it uh, sort of passively but that we're actually sort of right smack dab in the middle of that cycle uh, and actually have a significant influence on it. You know, do we pave our, our cities you know, or, or do we try to allow the water to infiltrate more? You know, little decisions like that, like in the Kathmandu Valley can cause flooding, I mean, declines of groundwater level, uh, all sorts of huge issues. And it's really, a, it's this anthropogenic. So it's this idea of the Anthropocene, a whole different geologic epoch where the people, the anthro, are actually causing sort of like uh, such a huge impact. They're actually, it's like a whole new epoch of, of history here in terms of the, uh, the Earth's history. Um, so hopefully that helps. I mean, put, putting the people in there is so important, but the biomes thing, you know, is really important. And then also the temporal and spatial, you know, changes are important to characterize. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions you were talking about some new ways that satellites are being used. Um, does satel are satellites able to measure groundwater or depths of aquifers? What are some of the other um, technological tools maybe that we have that we didn't in the past? Mm, yeah, well, this idea is, uh, is broadly referred to as remote sensing. So it's, it's this idea, in fact, we're all doing remote sensing right now. It's the idea of extracting information about something over a distance. So our eyes actually are remote sensors, if you think about it, uh, as we look at our screens here. And um, there are uh, really exciting developments almost every year in this space of remote sensing and, and actually earth observation is another thing that people call this. Um, about 10 years ago, there was a really exciting um, uh, set of things that happened. Um, that it's called GRACE, it's the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, uh, headed up by this uh, scientist by the name of Jay Famiglietti, who um, you know, discovered that they could use these pairs of satellites to actually measure gravitational changes on the Earth's surface, and that those gravitational changes were mostly due to the changes in water. And so, and so he did some modeling to kind of tease out how these gravitational changes represent changes in water storage in the aquifers, and then published a whole bunch of interesting papers on that. Um, it's very coarse. You know, you have to have a huge aquifer like the Central Valley to even get the start of kind of a signal out, out of the noise. Um, so it's, it's, it's maybe promising in one sense, but it's also challenging in the other. Um, some other interesting things are um, using Thermal remote sensing, um, you know, like when, you know, for the COVID checks, they, they scan your forehead to get your temperature. 
Well, from space now, we can measure the temperature of plants. And if you know the temperature of plants, you can tell if they're stressed or not. A hot plant means they don't have enough water. And it means that their, their tissues are starting to heat up, their stoma are closing. It means they need to be irrigated uh, if we want to maintain production. And so I'm really excited about these thermal remote sensing techniques to improve our decisions of when we irrigate and how much we need to irrigate. So those are a couple of examples that are exciting in the earth sensing and remote sensing space. Can you say a little bit more about the class that you had just um, proposed and will be taught at Chico State? Will that address some of these technological advances? What your new class? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so yeah, so this class is going to be called Spatial Hydrology. So Spatial Hydrology. It's an upper division civil engineering course. I'm hoping we can get some geoscience and um, you know other folks that are interested in, in hydrology and hydrogeology. Um, but the idea is these, these pictures essentially of the earth that the satellites are taking are not something that you can kind of just grab and like look at and make sense of. You know, in fact, you can't even put them into a spreadsheet and make sense of. It's just too much information. So you have to learn how to use programming languages um, to make sense of these data and sort of summarize them and then give you some sort of an output um, that's kind of human readable or human, you know, in a way that, that people can understand and, and maybe make decisions or learn from. And so these tools, these skill sets um, are essentially the focus of this class. And one of the primary tools is a programming language called Python. It's an open source programming language that gives you the ability to Kind of wrangle these large data sets, you know, gigabytes, terabytes uh, of information, and then extract, you know, information. Um, and we, we do this really cool thing in class um, where we look at how the climate of the whole US, state by state, and then within California, watershed by watershed changes over the last 125 years with real observations. Um, so it's actually like a look back at how is our climate changing both precipitation and temperature. And uh, I'd be happy to share some of the results from that if anybody's interested. So um, I liked your concept of the, uh, the top down and the bottom up and, and trying to find some sort of middle ground there. Um, in California, obviously, we've learned a lot more about climate change and um, new policies, new regulations. Are you seeing California in any way become more bottom up or more top down or kind of how are you seeing our, our state um, in that, in those different approaches to understanding and making decisions in the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a great question. And I think could be taken in several different directions. Um, I'll try to stay within my lane that I maybe know something about, which is water resources and, um, you know, the big development, uh, you know, it was in 1913, we passed the Water Conservation Act um, and, uh, or the, oh, sorry, it was the Water Commission Act of 1913. And that's where we established the State Water Resources Control Board or what became that. And then this very systematic way of, of uh, kind of centrally managing surface water rights. Um, but it took a whole nother hundred years, actually 101, to get to the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of 2014, which Dr. Christina Buck talked about last week. And um, you know, to, to tie this together with your question here, um, one thing that I think that SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, did a really good job of is it took some of the centralized decision-making uh, and actually distributed that down to a local level. And so it really established this authority of the groundwater sustainability agencies to make decisions based on local information, based on local stakeholder involvement. And so in that sense, I think Sigma was a nice step towards the bottom up um, and towards kind of like a more, a little bit more of a grassroots thing with the backstopping or the kind of the threat of a top down approach if the bottom-up approach was failing uh, over the course of the next 20 years. Um, so I think in that sense, there's been a, a bit of a, a bottom-up move. In terms of data, I feel like, um, you know, as a state and, and I think as a country, um, we're really 
still wrestling a little bit with how we use these satellite information kind of operationally. I think the scientific world is really sort of latched onto this and is all okay with it, but operationally, there's not a lot of irrigation districts or, you know, counties that rely sort of, you know, month to month or week by, by week on these data to make uh, kind of water planning decisions. And I think that's the, I think that's a direction where we can really push into here and, and make some real improvements with this top down approach of, of the satellite information, but involving community members at the same time to like kind of ground truth these top-down observations. It's so important we crown truth things with boots on the ground, you know, dirt in your fingernails type measurements as well. That's a great segue to um, a, another question about uh, the community members and, and how maybe we can learn from traditional ecological knowledge from first peoples, especially in our region, um, about the sustainability of water and um, it, it shows that you've worked all over the world and probably have learned a lot from indigenous peoples. Can you say a little bit more about um, that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a great, uh, a great question. And I, I feel like, um, I don't think I've lived in Chico long enough and know enough of the history to speak intelligently about um, the, some of the, you know, what we should learn or could learn from the peoples that lived here uh, before us. Um, I will, I will say um, in Nepal, I'll, I'll share maybe some experiences there. Um, I'm not sure if this really answers your question. I, I'm, I'm trying to uh, think, think through it a little bit, but um, in Nepal, I, I was um, very uh, cognizant or aware of the fact that uh, it was my role as a foreigner, uh, if you will, to spark you know, ideas and, um, and maybe kind of like think about systems or, or, or some structures for kind of mobilizing these students. Um, but it was very much up to them to decide as a community what to do with, with that. You know what I mean? Like, so I, you know, I can help uh, mobilize a group of students to understand their water resources systems, do the accounting. But then when it comes to, you know, setting those limits and deciding how to optimize within those limits, you know, that's really like a local process that, you know, I, I really, you know, can, can kind of step out of. Um, and, and it's actually exciting to see like this next generation of, of young researchers um, starting to kind of play uh, in these decision making processes, like at that level where they're, you know, we're using some of our information that we've generated at kind of like a, you know, like a you know, national context level in Nepal. And it's cool to see them doing that, but it's, it's like, it has to be up to them, I guess. And um, I guess in a certain sense, maybe we ought to do something, you know, maybe we ought to listen a little bit more like in the same way as that, where we say, hey, um, you know, tell, tell me about what it used to be like, I guess. And, and, and maybe that's a place to start, I guess. Um, which, speaking of which, I have, two or three students this summer that would love to interview you if you are a community member of Chico that has lived here for say 50 years, 40 years, and have some historical knowledge of what Big Chico Creek might have been like back in the 50s or 60s. If you know anybody that swam at one mile or you know hung out down by the Sacramento River as a kid, I would absolutely love to have my students uh, interview you and try to extract some of those stories. Um, so I, I hope some of you uh, kind of fit that mold. And if not, maybe point me in the right direction. I'd be uh, forever indebted uh, for something like that. That's a great call out. Um, and I think you're, you talked about stories and just the, the people's stories and people's reflections, people's oral histories. I can see how that would really um, play into long, you know, longer term understanding of your ecosystem. If anybody wants to um, reach out, uh, we can do that through the museum or um, I don't know if you want to put your uh, email in the chat. Um, I'm sure you may get some, um, we have some elder community members involved in the museum that I, I'm sure we could um, connect you with. Uh, yeah, I have wonderful. one kind of global question before we wrap up, um, and maybe this is it's a it's a tough topic, but with the um, moving away from Afghanistan and a lot of um, you know the American presence leaving Afghanistan, are there any projects that you're worried about 
um, that may be um, going to be jeopardized because of you know the change in what's happening in Afghanistan. Mm. Yes, yes. Well, there's so much happening in all these places that um, that I, we have so many friends now in, whether it be in Myanmar with the the military coup and the Tatmada and the um, in Nepal the COVID uh, you know variant taking over from India there or in Afghanistan with the um, challenges between the Afghan government and the Taliban and now the U.S. withdrawing and so yeah very challenging times in in many of those places. Um, well, <laughs> difficult question. If if uh, one thing I learned um, and I really believe in is is U.S. aid. You know the U United States Agency for International Development, U.S. aid. Um, just people across the world love love U.S. aid. I mean, U.S. aid has done so much good uh, for the world, and uh, in Nepal, people just love U.S. aid. They've given the uh, people from the U.S. a really positive uh, kind of standing in Nepal specifically. And um, one thing I would say is, is that if we, I mean, we, we've been investing a lot of money um, into Afghanistan through USAID um, in terms of building their food uh, security and their capacity to grow food, uh, in terms of their water management capacity, in terms of educational structures and all that. And I sure hope that we can continue that investment um, through USAID, and um, and that's an important one. I do worry a lot about uh, all the projects that that we've been working on that help with uh, you know women, education of of uh, rural uh, women, uh, help with you know rural livelihoods and, and agricultural production and all that. I think um, it's going to be a precarious time, and uh, I hope that whomever. Uh, you know, assumes control in Afghanistan, uh, whether it be the current government or some blend with the Taliban. I, I hope that they can um, kind of capture uh, a sense of what's best for their country and that we can maintain these partnerships moving forward. Um, Thank you. I, I know that was a, a hard question, but you're, you're someone who's been, you know, working on the ground there. So you, you must have a sense of that. I do have one last question. Um, given that water must be accounted for, do you foresee limits on development due to its uh, availability? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this idea of limits, um, boy, it seems like maybe it's, it, sh it should have come into our vocabulary a bit, a bit sooner, maybe. Um, but yeah, limits are limits are important. I mean, we we set limits for our children, you know, as we as we raise them and train them how to be a productive member of society. Of course, we set limits, you know, on them. This is this is the limit of of right and wrong, or this is the limit of of uh, un, enough or or too much, right? And uh, and I think the same goes for water resources. Absolutely, uh, we need to set um, limits. Now, in some places, we're not really challenged by being up against the wall with our limits. Um, but in certain places, we're probably way past that, you know, and, and so, uh, like, for example, you know, the San Joaquin Valley, we're, we're, we're probably way past that. And so, yes, there's going to be this process. Uh, Sigma is actually driving it, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, driving that, you know, trajectory back away from, you know, sort of something that we don't want, an undesirable result, trying to bring that back up to a, a reasonable limit. The Sacramento Valley, I'm afraid we're at this tipping point. They were, we're probably kind of right up against our limits here. And we better really be careful, you know, where we go from here, I guess. And uh, again, families, farms, feathers, fish. Uh, let's think about limits that help all four of those things because we need, we need all that, right? We need communities, we need food. We need, uh, you know, healthy streams and we need, you know, healthy, um, uh, uh, you know, ecosystems. So, yeah, limits are important, though. Thank you. So I just want to thank you also, again, so much for your talk tonight. I, I think you are a great additional resource for our community and our university. And I'm imagining that we might be able to have as an ongoing project when kids come to the museum, how to make their own rain gauges. 
and we can continue with the uh, emphasis on water. So well, you've mm. helped us think about a lot of possibilities. And I will say thanks again to our audience and to our audience, please remember to put our fall lecture series on your calendars. That's every Wednesday night in October. Do keep in touch with our website for upcoming events at the museum. Come visit our current exhibit, a wonderful quilting exhibit on California and sustainability. Tell all your friends, improving science literacy is up to all of us. Thanks and we'll see you in October, if not before.